Right, well, I think we'll, um, we'll get started then, uh, because it's uh, half past seven. Let me welcome all of you to uh, this um, uh, remote Cork Astronomy Club lecture. Uh, it's our last public lecture by Zoom. Uh, the next one on the 11th of April will be in a lecture theatre at UCC, and I'll, I'll tell you more about that later on. So my name is Peter. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to introduce to you uh, Professor Alan Fitzsimmons. Uh, Alan is uh, a, a professor at the School of Mathematics and Physics at Queen's University Belfast, and it is from Belfast that he's going to be speaking to us tonight. Uh, uh, Alan's a um, uh, research interest focus on uh, asteroids, comets, and other small solar system bodies. And what is going to specifically talk to us tonight is what makes a comet great. Comets are uh, perhaps one of the things which uh, are most eagerly anticipated by amateur astronomers. They're always predicted, some, sometimes years, sometimes even centuries in advance. Um, and uh, when they arrive, uh, they sometimes provide a mighty show and sometimes they're slightly disappointing and it's a bit difficult to predict when, but maybe Alan can fill us in on that kind of stuff and explain exactly what's going on. So, Alan, thank you very much for agreeing to talk to Cork Astronomy Club tonight and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Peter. And, and actually, thank you to all the members of the club, both online tonight and uh, absent without leave, uh, because it's always delightful to uh, um, uh, be invited to speak to an amateur astronomy society. It's a shame I'm not down there with you because uh, I quite enjoy visiting Cork and, and the south of Ireland. Uh, but be that as it may, uh, I'm stuck in my bedroom and uh, my bedroom, no, my, my study, I should say. And uh, and I see most people are in their rooms and uh, their houses and we see how we get on. So the first thing I'll do is I'll try to share my slides. So you should be able to see, hopefully, a tremendous view of one of the last great comets we could see in the night sky from Earth. This was uh, Comet McNaught back in 2006. And I should say right at the outset that you have a very biased speaker this evening because I've been performing scientific research on comets for almost four decades now. And in my view, all comets are great. I, I just love viewing the, uh, and, and studying these objects. Uh, so, uh, I, you know, I, I just think that with their things of wonder, and part of that is, is as Peter actually mentioned it in his introduction, that's, we're never quite sure what they're going to do and how they're going to behave. But, Nevertheless, occasionally we do get something that really is tremendously awe-inspiring in the sky, something we call a great comet. And so uh, this is uh, what I'm really going to talk about this evening. I'm going to spend a little time just explaining what we understand by a comet, what we know about comets and, and how the, do they work. Then come along to the definition of a great comet look at the reasons why a comet can be great, why, uh, in fact, most comets aren't that great, although I like them. And then I'll end with a little bit of, um, uh, uh, a bit of an ex exploration, perhaps, into not only what makes something perhaps not great visually, but scientifically great, but also perhaps when can we expect the next one? OK, well, let's start off by looking at where comets lie. Here we have an overhead view of the solar system, old enough that not only do we have the outer planets, the gas giants, or orbits of Jupiter and Saturn, but also the ice giants, Eunice and Neptune. We even have a uh, poor old dwarf planet Pluto, again, as I was saying, showing how old this slide is. And then in lighter blue, we have the, uh, uh, the orbits of three of the literally hundreds of comets we now know exist orbiting our sun. Uh, comet Halley, or Halley's Comet, over on the left. Uh, comet Borelli, down in the middle of a small orbit there, relatively speaking. And then a comet called uh, Comet Ikea Zang. So uh, those are the comet orbits. And you can see their orbits are very different. 
uh, from uh, the orbits of the planets. They're much more elongated or elliptical. And although they can pass very close to our sun and be warmed by the sun, at the other end of their orbits, they've got to be very cold because they're a long way from the sun. And this is why we see comets change as they orbit and will go around the sun along these paths. Now, at the heart of every comet is something looking like this, and not, not exactly like this. Uh, this is a, a singular comet that we've visited, of course. This is the nucleus of comet 67P of gerasimenko which was orbited by the ESA-Rosetta mission for two years, uh, just a few years ago. And when a comet is close to the sun, one can see in this image quite nicely what happens, that the comet is composed of, of large amounts of ice, frozen ices, frozen gases, in, and small dust particles, small solid particles. When it's near the sun in its orbit, the sun's heat melts those ices, they turn to gas and they stream off into space, carrying those once embedded dust particles with them. So here we have the sun on the left, and you can see it illuminating this nucleus. That's roughly four kilometers across. And we can see this material streaming off into space. Now, one thing that can be misleading about a picture like this is that a, a nucleus looks quite bright, but that's because the, the cameras on board Rosetta were, of course, designed to get us such fantastic images like this. In fact, a comet nucleus is about as dark as a lump of coal or even darker. And that's because although we have lots of bright ice in it, it's covered generally by a very uh, thin, well, a, a, a layer, should we say, a relatively thin layer of this dark comet dust. And these small microscopic dust particles are very dark themselves because they can contain a lot of carbon, like coal. And so, in fact, if you were going to look at uh, something like this by eye, if you could be on that spacecraft, then you would see a very, very dark object in front of you. And in fact, the brightest thing would be pretty much uh, the sun or even the stars that you can see behind the comet in this image. So that's at the heart of every, of every comet. That's the nucleus. That's where all the material is actually stored in a comet until it's heated by the sun. Now, what happens to that gas and those small microscopic dust particles when they're released by the nucleus? Well, the gravity on a comet nucleus is really slow. It's really small because um, it, there's just not a lot of mass there. It's much, much smaller than a planet or even most or many asteroids. So when that material is released by the nucleus, it expands freely out into space forming a transient atmosphere around the comet called a nucleus. And what I like to do when I'm giving a talk, by the way, uh, uh, to uh, amateur astronomy societies such as your own, uh, I like to look at their websites and maybe grab a couple of images that I could use uh, to illustrate these things. So, for example, here we've got a wonderful image of Comet Atlas by Derek O'Keefe, uh, taken about four years, uh, three or four years ago, although Derek you haven't said which comet atlas it is because I'm on the atlas project and we've discovered 67 of them so far. So uh, you need to be a little bit more specific, please, in your, in your labeling. But anyway, what we have here now is a view from Earth of one of those comets close to the sun. The nucleus on this scale is impossible to see. And in fact, we can't see it because it's buried in this thrown out, transient, expanding atmosphere of gas and dust that we call the coma of a comet. And so we have the coma here surrounding that hidden nucleus in the center. And the coma in images can generally be anywhere between 10,000 and 100,000 kilometers across. This coma here is probably closer to 10 or 20,000 uh, kilometers in diameter in this image. But one can also see, of course, then in this in this uh, image that the, the sun is up towards the left and going down towards the right is what makes a comet so fantastic sometimes to see, and that's its tail, or rather one of them, because comets have two main types of tail. The dust particles that are released from that nucleus 
at the heart of the comet are blown back by the pressure of sunlight on them alone. They're so small and so light that radiation pressure, the, so, the pressure of sunlight reflecting off them is enough to push them away from the sun. And that's what forms what we call the dust tail of a comet. And in a well-developed comet, and here's the comet West 1976, but in this well-developed image, uh, uh, well-developed uh, uh, comet here, we can see that the dust tail is stretching over a million kilometers from the uh, from the nucleus. So that's what happens to the dust. The gas molecules, as they're released from the surface ices, eventually get ionized by ultraviolet light from the sun. They get an electron knocked off them, and when they do, they can be picked up by the solar wind and blown back away from the sun by the solar wind, and that forms the gas tail or the iron tail. And most of the time we see the iron tail stretching even further from the nucleus than the dust tail, generally between, at least between one or 10 million kilometers long. Of, of course, the visibility of these tails depends on how much stuff that, that there is that the comet is releasing. If it's not releasing much, the tails won't be so spectacular. If it's releasing a lot of gas to go into the iron tail and a lot of these microscopic dust particles to go into the dust tail, then you'll be able to see these tails much, much more clearly. So that's how comets work. And the important thing to realize is that most comets don't look like that last image of Comet West. So as I mentioned, I'm, I'm a member of the Atlas project. So looking at today's data from our now four telescopes that we use to survey the sky every night, here's just a section of the four comets we observed today uh, in our survey of the sky. So we've got all the, none of these are, have been discovered uh, by us, uh, well, uh, this year at least. Uh, they've all they've all been known for some time. We have Comet 19P Borelli up at the top left, which is about 10th magnitude at the moment, so it can be seen in a small telescope. Then we have 73P Shrushman Fuckman 3 up there, which is a bit fainter. This is about 13th magnitude at the moment. Then down at, in the bottom left, we have 70P Kohima, which is about 15th, 16th, actually, I think a 16th, 17th magnitude. And then going back, here's one of our comets we have discovered from Atlas. This is Comet C2020Y2, or one of our comet atlases. So most comets uh, that we see every night in the night sky are telescopic objects. Although they are have a nucleus and it's releasing this material and it's forming the coma and it's forming the tails, of the, in these individual comets, there's just not enough stuff there, or the comets are a bit too far away for them to be you know, noticeable in the night sky. We do need to know where to look, and we need a reasonably sized telescope to see most of these objects. But occasionally, of course, you will see a comet that you can spot by eye. So the last one, I guess, that was easily seen was the summer before last, Comet 2020 F3 Neowise, which was quite lovely. First of all, when it appeared in the morning sky, then it moved around and it was, it was pretty visible during the middle of the night. So on the left, I've got a, uh, a lovely image by uh, uh, an amateur astronomer and photographer here in Northern Ireland, Martin McKenna. And then on the right, uh, 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 probably a week or two later, I've got one of my own shots uh, which which I don't have, I'm not quite as good as Martin at taking pictures of these things, but hopefully you can see on the right, you can see the comet there above some noctilucent clouds, uh, low down on the northern horizon, uh, as seen from just uh, north of Belfast, and you've got the plough up there on the top left. So you can see these comets are, can be quite lovely. This is a lovely comet to observe, but it was, it was still not a great comet. It was just a really nice one. But I am familiar with great comets because actually this is a shot, I think I took this picture last year, where I'm sitting and talking to you right now. This is when I'm actually doing some work. And above my computer and my, um, and my LCD monitor uh, here, I do have uh, two or three pictures. And in particular, the middle picture is a print of the great comet of 1843 one of the brightest comets we've ever been able to see from Earth. And if we look at some of the, the etchings and engravings that were done uh, 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 
when this comet was around. Unfortunately, this comet arrived a little early, too early for photography. But one can see how stunning and spectacular it, it was to be seen uh, over, uh, first of all, uh, um, originally over um, in the Southern Hemisphere when it was first seen back in March that year. Then on the right, I believe that's a view from Paris on the 19th of March. Now, of course, in the 1840s, we didn't have the problem of light pollution that we do now. So even from a major capital city in Europe, one could see these things, but one can see in the evening sky there this beautiful comet after sunset. And if you look carefully, what you can see in that image, Orion, the constellation of Orion above the comet tail showing you exactly how spectacular that comet must have seen. And that indeed was a great comet. And great comets over the years, over the centuries even, have had a tremendous impact on, on art and really our view of the universe. And one famous example, of course, is the picture on the left here by the great Renaissance artist Giotto di Bondoni, or Giotto, as we know, who saw a, a comet, and we believe it was Halley's Comet, and a few years later was uh, been so struck by it on the left-hand side that he used it to represent the Star of Bethlehem in his painting of the Nativity. Now, here, it's a comet's been viewed as a force for good, clearly. However, quite often, uh, they were regarded as omens or bad ideas. Here's, a, here's a, an image from a medi medieval manuscript of the various forms of comets that you might see if you are unlucky enough, because clearly, uh, looking at the way the artist has drawn them, you see that uh, there's uh, uh, having a, a huge sword, flaming sword, hanging above you in the night sky is probably not a good thing. So, um, so clearly they've been viewed, but in differently in different ways over the over the centuries and millennia. But they are, can still be awe-inspiring, and that iconography carries with us today. Pop down to your local supermarket and take a look at a few things. Here's a bottle of bubbly on the left. Here's, well, it says it there, Comet Scourer on the right. And both of them are inspired by this, almost this racial history of great comets. And if you've never, again, if you've never seen a truly tremendous great comet in the sky, you might think this is all a bit tenuous. But all one again needs to do is go back into history and look at think, pictures like this, this engraving of Comet Donati. And I think this, uh, this is somewhere in Europe, I can't remember where, I don't think it, it might be Venice in 1858. And just imagine how impressive that must have been to actually walk out of the door at night and see that hanging over you. And of course, these things could often appear without warning, be there for a few days or at most a few weeks and then disappear again, letting you know that no matter how powerful you felt humanity was, you were not in control of the world around you. So great comets have had a tremendous influence, I believe, over the centuries. But Coming back to it, one thing I haven't done is define what a great comet is. So let's do that. Generally, we think, believe, or we term a comet a great comet if it's a bright, as the brightest stars, and there's clearly one of these tremendous tails going across it. And you can see it in a twilight or dark sky because we have had um, examples, as we'll see, of incredibly bright comets, but they've been so close to the sun that they haven't been able to see at their, at their very brightest. But we're, uh, even then, quite often, you can, uh, they have been spotted sooner rather than later. So that's what a great comet is. It's a really bright comet as seen from Earth. And the question then is, well, I've shown you lots of pictures earlier of comets that weren't great, they're pretty, pretty dim, you needed a good telescope to see them. So what makes a great comet? Well, what makes a great comet 
I'm sorry, I've just remembered I had this slide as well. Just a table showing you the kind of some of the great comets that we've had over the past 100 years or a little more than 100 years. And what you'll notice, we had two. In 1910, we had the Great Day Daylight Comet uh, about two or three months before Comet Halley came around, and that was incredibly impressive. Then we had one in 1927, a bit of a gap, but then we had quite a few in the 60s and 70s. We had a couple in the 1990s, a couple in the 2000s. On average, these great comets come around about once every 10 years or so. Now, this is a random process. You can't say that we're overdue for one at any moment. But on average, in your lifetime, you should be able to see for at least, hopefully, three or four great comets, although sometimes you have to get up early in the morning to see them. So I was going to say, what, which comets can become a great comet? And it depends on these factors. It depends on size. It depends on composition, what the comet is made of precisely it depends on its orbit about the sun then it also depends on where the earth is when that comet reaches the sun now we'll go through all of these four points now so first of all size here's a montage or to scale of all the comet nuclei we have either visited with spacecraft or have been able to resolve using telescopes, either optical telescopes or radar, uh, radio telescopes from Earth, or in, in fact, in one case, from Mars. And what you can see is that some of them are pretty small. In fact, they're about uh, uh, maybe just half a kilometre across or so, where some are much larger, some are monsters. And in fact, the largest comet nucleus we've ever got a good view of is the nucleus of Halley's Comet when the Giotto spacecraft flew past it in 1986. And Halley is a, is a, is a beast. It's about 15 kilometers uh, along by seven kilometers wide. And one of the reasons then it is so bright is because the larger the nucleus, the more surface area there is to release gas and dust. And the more gas and dust you release, the more light that gas and dust is able to reflect and the brighter it appears. So the bigger the nucleus, the more material it loses into its atmosphere of the tails. And so the more light those tails and atmosphere reflect to be, to be seen on Earth. So size, unlike what my mother told me, is important. OK, so we have to remember that. First of all, the comet nucleus is crucial in these things. And here's one example of, where, of a comet where, although we didn't get very good measurements of the nucleus, we believe it did have a big nu nucleus. Here's great, a great comet from 1969, Comet Bennett. And Comet Bennett was a tremendous sight in the night sky in 1969. I'm afraid I didn't see it because I was a little young then to be... Um, to, to know where to look. Also, I was growing up, by the way, in London, so not very good for light pollution. But I'm just wondering, it'd be interesting to hear afterwards if, if some of the uh, perhaps more experienced members of the Cork Astronomy Club uh, remember seeing this back then. So we believe, for example, Comet Bennett was bright because it had a big nucleus. The next thing we want to look at is composition. Now, remember that I said that when a comet comes around the sun, its nucleus not only releases its ices as gas, but it also releases these dust particles. And we see them in the gas tail and, and the dust tail. But here I've plotted spectra of, of a comet. And I've plotted the spectra of those two components. Well, the important thing is that don't worry about the numbers. Just think this is brightness going this way. And this is wavelength of light. Now we're going from the ultraviolet all the way to the near infrared here. So I'll put below the band which we can perceive optical colors or optical light with our eyes. And in purple, what we can see is that when we look at the light reflect, the sunlight reflected by the gas molecules in the comet, they reflect light at particular wavelengths. And in fact, one of the most common wavelengths or common uh, wavelengths where we see light reflect from gas 
is caused by carbon gas or car C2 gas, where two carbon atoms bonded together to form gas. And this is very good at reflecting light in the green and, and, and near blue part of the spectrum, which is why in modern photographs of comets with modern you know, digital cameras and so on, quite often you see the head of the comet, the atmosphere of the coma glowing green. And that's coming from those gas molecules here. So you can see that they, they reflect a lot of light in the green, not so much, or quite a few bit in the blue, although our eyes aren't so sensitive in the blue, and then there's not much happening in the red. So that's the gas. The dust particles reflect light at all wavelengths because they're literally just solid bits, and those solid bits reflect all wavelengths of light coming from the sun. So if we were to take a spectrum of, of comet dust, we actually see the spectrum of the sun again peaking around about the, the blue green region here and then diminishing back down as we go towards the near infrared and so when we get a spectrum of a comet we see when we see light from comet we're seeing both of those things mixed together when we look at the head or the coma of the comet we see something like this dark blue line here so this is what the light looks like coming from a comet as we change wavelength but, what, but when we look at comets, not all of them have the same relative amount of gas to dust. In this simulation, what I've shown you are spectra where we've got just as much gas coming off as dust. But we know that the comets exist where, for, if you've got, even though you've got the same amount of gas coming off the comet and reflecting sunlight, there's much more dust coming off. And so if there's much more dust, it can reflect a lot more sunlight. And here's what we might see if, for example, we have a normal comet in blue reflecting this amount of light as a function of wavelength versus a comet where there's 10 times as many dust particles as normal. And here you can see there's a huge amount more light being reflected from the sun, particularly around the optical region. And that's why composition of comets can be important as well, because the more dust particles there are, particularly, the easier it is to see, because it reflects so much more light than the gas molecules. And we've had very recently, in our lifetimes at least, a comet that really did have a huge amount of dust being released. And that was Comet Hale-Bopp back in 1997. Uh, uh, and Again, for those of us who were around at that time and, and interested in astronomy, that was one of the day, times when it was really easy to explain what the comet was, because after sunset for about a month, you could go out your front door, point and go, look, there's a comet. It really was fantastic. And again, I see there's a beautiful image from Susan Aylwin. Uh, on the Cork Astronomy Club website. So that's the one on the left when you can actually see this lovely, lovely scan of this photo. You can even see the Andromeda galaxy just below it. It really, it really was, it was first magnitude to, to zero magnitude for about a month after sunset. Um, and in this image on the, right, on the right, you can see the tremendous bright uh, dust tail, which was really what struck the eye. The, the gas tail was actually much fainter. And importantly, um, uh, there was a, not only a lot of dust released by, from this comet compared to gas, but this comet had a nucleus that was one of the largest we've ever measured. It was about 70 kilometers in diameter. So even though it was releasing a lot of dust to reflect light, there was also a lot of surface of that nucleus to reflect light as well. And because of that, that's what gave us the great comet Hale-Bopp in 1997. Well, the next thing we have to think about is the orbit. And the orbit's important two ways. First of all, it's because we have two different types of comet, generally speaking, orbiting our sun. Now, on the left, we've got the uh, orbits of the inner planets from Mercury out to Mars, and then the orbit of the planet Jupiter, as they are today, uh, the positions of the planets are as they are today. I'd like being uh, current uh, with, my, with my talks. Uh, 
And here we have the orbit of Comet Borelli. Now, that was one of those comets I saw you that we imaged today as well from the Atlas survey. And you can see, while well, we see it very clearly, Earth's over here and, and Borelli's here. So we're relatively close to the comet and the comet's relatively close to the sun. It's just outside the Earth's orbit at the moment. Um, and because, um, and so we actually see Borelli quite often. In fact, it comes around once every 6.8 years because that's, its orbit is relatively small. But because it comes around so often, then every time it goes around the sun, when it re releases all that gas and dust, it, that never comes back. And effectively, it's starting to run out of material. And so with these, what we call short period comets, and these they're with, with re relatively short water periods of only a few years, we, they can appear quite nice, but none of them appear intrinsically that bright. Whereas if we compare it to Comet Hale-Bopp, here's Comet Hale-Bopp's orbit compared to our, our, planet, our solar system. And in fact, here I've had to zoom out and here we can see the orbits of Jupiter, uh, orbits and positions of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune as they are today. And here is also where Hale-Bopp is. And you can see this orbit is much, much larger. In fact, at the moment, its orbital period is almost two and a half thousand years. It doesn't come around the sun that long. So it's, got a, it, so it's actually going to last a lot longer than a comet like Borelli, and it, doesn't, and it can keep active for a, a lot longer as well. So these long period comets, which are going to have orbital periods of thousands, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of years, tend to be brighter than the short period comets because they're not coming around the sun that often. So the orbit's important because of that. But the orbit's also important because it dictates how close to the sun the comet gets. Now, this is a complicated diagram. This is something from, that I have in my, use in my research. We know that comets are a release material because of the ice turning into gas when it's heated by the sun. Well, for various different types of frozen gases or ices like water, uh, ammonia, carbon dioxide, methane and nitrogen ices, I can calculate if I say that, OK, well, I've got these ices on the surface of the nucleus and they're covered a little bit with dust, comet dust. How much am I going to release from each square meter of the surface as we go in towards the sun? And you can see that as we go in towards the sun, well, uh, nitrogen and methane kick in a long way out, but there's not a lot of nitrogen and methane there. Carbon dioxide kicks in at about 15, 16 astronomical units from the sun, where that's 60, 15 or 16 times the Earth's sun distance. Ammonia, if it's there, kicks in at about 10 astronomical units. And water doesn't really kick in until about four astronomical units or so. But because we know from studying comets that the majority of the ice in a comet is water ice, that means that once this kicks in, we certainly see this increase in activity and the amount of material, that amount of gas, I should say, that the comet is releasing climbs increasingly as we go in from, Mar from Jupiter's orbit through to Mars's orbit, to the Earth's orbit, through to inside the orbit of Venus and even inside the orbit of Mercury. So the closer the comet gets to the sun, the more it's heated and the more material it will release, which implies that if you want a really, really nice comet, a really bright comet, we want one with possibly with a big nucleus, but we also want to get it in close to the sun. And so one really nice example of this was Comet West, now, discovered in 1975, but was closest to the sun in early 1976. And this, again, was a truly spectacular comet discovered by Richard West at the European Southern Observatory. And it was one of the, the first great comets that had, had, had really nice colour photographs made of it. And it was a very, very... Uh, uh, um, bright because it became very close to the sun. In fact, Comet West is really what we call a sun grazing comet. It passed very, it passed well within the orbit of Mercury. 
but not as close as one other great comet in the last century did. And that was Comet Ikea Seki, roughly 10 years earlier in the mid 1960s, where, as you can see from this image from a solar telescope built to image the corona of the sun by blocking out the sun's light, Ikea Seki actually or passed really close to the surface of our sun. And that's what made it intrinsically so bright but as a sun grazer, but it was very hard to see until a few days after this image was taken when it came out from behind it, from, around, from close to the sun again. But we've had similar sun grazing comets recently, and probably the most famous was about 15, 16 years ago now, Comet McNaught. Now, Comet McNaught was a sun grazing comet, and it was absolutely spectacular from the southern hemisphere of Earth because it tended to be that in that part of the sky. We really didn't get a great view of it from, uh, from Europe, except when it was closest to the sun, you could see it in the daytime sky. And this is a beautiful image by Stefan Sieg over, I think, in Germany. And you can see he, he was very careful. He had his telescope behind a wall in the shade because he was looking quite close to the sun at the time. But Comet McNaught was again one of these sun grazers and was incredibly bright. So if you knew where to look, you could actually spot this comet uh, in the daytime in, uh, back then. And since then, we've had another great comet, which was a sun grazing comet about uh, 11 years ago now, actually 10 years ago, because it was at the end of 2011, uh, was Comet Lovejoy. Again, unfortunately for us, mostly visible from the Southern Hemisphere. I think, that, that, again, this is a, an image taken from Chile from one of the astronomers down at the European Southern Observatory. But you can see this beautiful um, searchlight of a, co of a comet tail. Uh, stretching up from the horizon before sunrise. And in fact, if you look out for it, there's a beautiful video of it, of it rising above the Earth, taken by astronauts on board the International Space Station. Really, really tremendous. So orbits are really important. The closer a comet nucleus gets to the sun, the brighter it can be. Final, final uh, uh, thing that's important to make a great comet, location. Not of the comet, as such, but of the Earth. It's for, a, for us to see a great comet, sometimes it's important where we are. So let me explain. Here's a diagram of a comet that's coming in to go around the sun, and it, it, there is its trajectory in black. It hasn't actually been around the sun yet. It's still coming in, but there in blue is the orbit of the Earth. Now, if the Earth happens to be over the other side of the sun when that comet's coming in. Well, as the slide says, it's going to be a bit rubbish because the comet is going to be mostly close to the sun in the sky and even behind the sun. So we're not going to get a very good view of it. If the Earth's over here in its orbit when the, orbit, when the comet comes through, that's going to be pretty nice. If the, if the Earth is there, it's great. I mean, maybe this could be a great comet because it's close enough to us that it really is bright in the sky. And if you're really lucky, although if you've saw that Netflix film over the Christmas, maybe just not too unlucky, then you get a really close approach. And that happened to us twice in the last century because the year before Hale Bopp arrived, we had Comet 1996, Hayakataki, appear. And this wasn't intrinsically that bright a comet, but it passed within 15 million kilometers of the Earth. And I remember I was, I was working and living in Belfast. I was working at Queen's University of Belfast at the time, and me and a bunch of friends we realized it was going to be clear. It's February, so the weather prospects weren't good, but there was one clear night near closest approach. We went out to north of Belfast because it was in the northern sky, and we could see the tail of the comet stretching 70 degrees across the sky. It was absolute, it was like a searchlight. It was absolutely amazing. I will never forget that. So that was one occasion where we had a great comet because, simply because the comet appeared uh, uh, passed very close to the Earth. 
But a much earlier apparition was of Halley's Comet. Now, Halley, of course, comes around the sun once every 76 years. And if you want proof of that, you only need to go and visit the Bayeux Tapestry and look at where King Harold is being warned by his courtiers that, hey, there's something in the sky. It's not looking good for the Battle of Hastings. He should have listened. And if you look very closely at the Bayeux Tapestry, you can see this beautiful representation of Halley's Comet in 1066, when it was around then. And it was relatively bright but then, but probably not as bright as in 1910, the apparition before last, when it indeed passed very close to the Earth uh, as it passed through the inner solar system. And indeed, um, it was so spectacular uh, that everybody was celebrating. Now, if you look at the history books, you will hear that, oh, they discovered cyanogen, which is a poisonous gas, and everybody was scared and worried they were going to die. Don't believe a word of it. This is how people celebrated in 1910. So you have Comet Whiskey from America on the top left. You have Comet Ale from Salford over in England in the right. In, in, in right and in bottom left, well, there you go. Comet parties are now the fad of Paris. So it's, it's French champagne all around. Everybody celebrated seeing Halley's Comet in the sky in 1910. So being close to this Earth can also be really important for a great comet. Now, all of this covers great comets as we naturally understand them. There's another thing that I thought I'd just mention which is maybe it's not great by eye, but comets can be scientifically great or at least scientifically important. And I've come across, uh, I thought I'd mention this because Peter, when he invited me, mentioned this new comet coming in, comet Bernardinelli, sorry, Bernard, I practiced this earlier, but Bern, Bernardinelli Bernstein, thank you very much. I apologize if anybody knows either of these astronomers. If you go onto the internet and look, go particularly to YouTube, here's four YouTube videos you can watch after the, the Astronomy Club's meeting is finished this evening. Giant comet on its way, says one, which is true. Dark energy telescope finds monster comet. Kind of right. Giant cometary object size of a minor planet is approaching from the Oort cloud. Yes, except minor planets are asteroids and all comets are about the size of asteroids because asteroids have a lot of different sizes and it's not 200 kilometers across. It's about 134 kilometers across. Scientists are worried. No, we're not. Um, the important thing is that this comet could be, is not going to become a great comet as seen from Earth. Why? Well, I thought I might as well show you rather than YouTube videos, a true image of the comet. And here it is in one of the discovery images from the dark energy uh, sky survey down in uh, Cerro Tololo, uh, down in Chile. And uh, back there, in this image, it's about 21st, 20th magnitude or something like this. Why isn't this monster comet, which has a nucleus twice as big as Hale Bob, why isn't this going to become a great comet? Because here, we, again, we've got a plot of our solar system as it is today. And here's the orbit of comet, well, let's just call it comet BB. And you can see that at its closest, it's lying outside the orbit of Saturn. This is coming nowhere near the sun. It's coming nowhere near the inner solar system. It's still coming in. It's not going to get closest to the sun, which will be about there until the tw January 2031. But even then, it's going to be a little under 11 astronomical units from the sun. And it's really, you're really going to need a good telescope to see this one. So it's not going to be a great comet across, streaming across the skies by any means. But scientifically, it's important because it's so big and already emitting so much material. We can study the behavior of this comet much easier than we could see. We can see any other active comets out there because it's simply throwing out much more material than a normal comet because its nucleus is so big. So it's going to be much easier to study, not only with the JWST and HST, but also with comets here on Earth. So 
that's just going to be a scientifically great comet, but not a great, great comet. But wouldn't it be great if there was one? If I'm, I think I'm using the word great too many times. So when is it? When's it due? Don't know. But what, I've, what I want to point out as we finish is one final thing. This is a plot I made uh, last year, actually, I should update this, of the number of comets discovered each, I think this is each six month period. Um, no, no, actually, no, it is every year. Every comet is discovered each year as a function of time from 1990 to 2020, so over 30 years. In blue, we have the comets discovered by amateur astronomers, although some of these amateur, some of the amateur astronomers that, that have discovered these comets have used <laughs> relatively large telescopes, I must admit. And in orange, we have all the comets discovered by so-called professional observatories, sky surveys, and so on. And one can see, though, overall, we're discovering more and more comets as time goes on, as particularly as our professional tel telescopes get more sensitive and we develop more uh, better, better telescopes and better detectors to find them. And what this means is that we're very unlikely or becoming increasingly unlikely to be taken by chance the next time we have a great comet coming in. It, we should spot it. We should have at least a few months warning, perhaps years of warning before the next one comes in. So for example, here's one we found six days ago. Here's a long period comet coming in. Uh, it's not even got a name yet. It's a, our internal name is A10GBIZ. It won't be called that when it's finally confirmed and it's orbit is in, but we already know that this is not gonna be a great comet. We've tracked, it's been tracked over six nights. We know that it's not gonna come in closer than uh, uh, the asteroid belt. In fact, the outer asteroid belt, it comes into about three and a half astronomical units from the sun in i think the year 2024 so we've got another two years before it's closest to the sun and unfortunately this one isn't going to be a great comet um but we never know when we're going to discover the next great comet and this is what keeps me and all the other people in atlas looking at these small fuzzy dots of light every day because we really want the next great comet to be a comet atlas rather than well one of our competitors. Although, you know, we'll, we'll, once we do find a new comet, great comet coming in, everybody will share it. So here's my final slide, just to remind you, a great comet can be a tremendous view in the night sky, evening or morning. If it's morning, make try to get up for it, it'll be worth it. It often needs though a large nucleus because the brightness of it depends on how much light it reflects, which depends on how much material it releases, which can depend on how much surface area the nucleus has. So you want a big icy nucleus. It generally needs to pass close to the Earth or the Sun, although Hale-Bopp only came within one astronomical unit of both the Earth and the Sun roughly back in 1997, so not always. It helps if it's very dusty because dust is much better reflecting sunlight than gas. So it helps if it has more dust than gas in it. But the important thing is that we should get months, if not years of warning of the next potential great comet. But let's wait and see. And that's where I'll finish. Thank you very much. Alan, many thanks, that was fascinating. And uh, now is the time to ask questions to our speaker, Professor Alan Simmons. Now, Alan, I'm gonna ask the first question because there's something which is puzzling me. And that is, uh, I'm not quite sure of the definition of a comet, uh, which is a bit embarrassing as you've been talking to us about comets for 40 minutes. But, um, I mean, it, could, could any old asteroid become a comet if it had the right orbit, if it had one of those elliptical orbits? Has, does any asteroid have enough gas and dust associated with it? Because in my mind, asteroids have no dust, they're just solid things and they don't have any gas either. But maybe I've got that wrong. I'm just trying to work out if an asteroid had the orbit of a comet, would it become a comet? Or maybe that couldn't happen anyway. Maybe my question doesn't make sense. But you no, 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 make no. sense out of it. No, it's fair enough. So, so historically, anything that appeared to grow eject material to grow an atmosphere and maybe even tails would be called a comet. Now, as our understanding progressed, we then ch really changed that a, li a little bit 
to uh, say, well, okay, what we're looking at are really primordial bodies from the birth of our solar system that have a lot of that uh, original, uh, those frozen gases, those ices locked in them. And if they have orbits that bring them close to the sun, we see that material escape, and that's what we call a comet. Interesting enough, we, there are uh, some asteroids we now know that do come close enough to the sun that they will start effectively melting. The, effect, if the real term is sublimating because they don't melt into a liquid, they're in a vacuum, so the, 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 the surface material goes straight into a gas. And, and whether or not we call them comets is an interesting question because they would look like they look like comets in our images, the, 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 the small number, or uh, but they really are rocky asteroids. So we actually think of them more as rock comets in the sense that they're made of rock, but they get so close to sun. And you've got to remember that the melting point of rock is somewhere between, um, let me just do a conversion in my head, uh, somewhere between 800 and 1300 degrees centigrade. So to get an asteroid to start releasing material, you need to get it really quite close to the sun. But there are some of these objects that we found now that we believe are asteroids, but you wouldn't see, you wouldn't notice them if you're just looking doing a general survey of the solar system. So generally, the the most of the uh, asteroids we look at are pretty inert. They're not losing any material, and they're just lumps of rock. Although they're not solid, uh, maybe I'll give you a talk on asteroids at some point and tell you how we know why asteroids aren't actually solid. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's another story altogether. But that's, that's fine. I mean, the important thing is that uh, generally when we look at it from an observational point of view, if we look at something moving, so it's all, uh, against the background stars, so we know it's in orbit about our sun, or at least it's, 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 uh, it's traveling through our solar system. And if it's fuzzy, even with, or perhaps even has a tail, we might call it a comet. But these days we're a little bit more careful. Thanks, Alan. Right. Uh, so uh, uh, over to you, Paul and Declan, to, uh, to, to call the other questions. OK, thank you, Peter. I'll take maybe two and then I'll hand over to, to Paul. I'm going to copy Peter, actually, and ask a question myself before going into the other ones. Um, the 1843 comet that you mentioned, which by all accounts was really spectacular, especially when you think of the dark skies that were around at the moment. Mm. What was the, the social reaction to that? I'm thinking two years later when the potato famine, or sorry, when the potato blight swept across Europe and we all know the impact of that here. Did people kind of say, oh, that was a warning. We should have listened. We didn't. This is the payback. You know? Well, the interesting, I, that's a good question. I'm not really sure, but I've not come across any direct link mm or at least supposed link, I should say, between the comet two or three years earlier and, and, and the famine. But as we know, Eve, I think people really haven't changed that much over recorded history. We tend to have short memories. So if something's happening, something happens like a comet appears and then the following week something happens, mm. or it was an omen. But something that, if something happened two or three years previously, then you're possibly more likely to assign it to somebody killing a black cat by mistake or something like this. I'm not sure, but it'll be no. But it's an interesting question, and honestly, I don't know. I certainly, certainly, when you read the the, the popular accounts of the comet of 1843, you know, by that stage, astronomers didn't know exactly how a comet worked. We did know about the icy nucleus in the center and so on, but they knew they'd known since <laughs> Edmund Halley. That um, that the comets uh, comets went in these big orbits around the sun, and even before him, you know, Tycho Brahe, the great the, the greatest pre-telescope astronomer, had shown that they were comets weren't in the atmosphere in the Middle Ages. People one thought they might belong to the Earth, but Tycho Brahe was the first astronomer to show that no, these things are, for, are outside our atmosphere, in fact, further away than the Moon. He showed. So, so uh, there was a bit, there was, you know, there's quite a bit of understanding in the mid 1800s. And I think that kind of superstition had certainly gone away, uh, mostly, although 
not completely judging by today's internet. Okay. Um, question from Michael Goss. Has a comet ever hit the Earth? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so we don't, it's when we just look at craters <laughs> on the Earth caused by um, objects hitting it, it's really hard, if not sometimes, in, most of the time impossible to tell whether or not it was a comet or an asteroid that hit us and made that hole in the ground. We certainly know that at the moment, when we do our surveys of, of the solar system, that you've got a, uh, you, uh, the chance of a comet hitting the Earth is about one hundredth the chance of an asteroid. So we are completely dominated at the moment by asteroids hitting the Earth rather than comets. But if we go back in time quite a long way to the first few tens of millions of years of the solar system when our Earth had only just formed and perhaps about the time of the giant, uh, of the giant impact that formed the moon, we know our, our um, Earth was born hot and dry. It was hot. I mean, there was pretty, we know that on the surface there was, there was very little water. And now, well, actually, today was lovely, but this morning was pretty wet here in Belfast. So I can tell you that there's a lot of water now. And a, a big question for many years has been, where does the Earth water come from? And we know from our models and our studies of the evolution of the solar system that the Earth was hit by a lot of comets in, in the early days. And so it's always been suspected that the Earth's water came from comets. Just this is the water left over. You, you, it may be vaporized when a comet hits, but then it reaccumulates and eventually it rains on the Earth. Now, that was one of the things that the Rosetta probe was sent to test with comet 67P, Jurium of Gerasimenko. And in, importantly, what it found was that the type of water in comet 67P is not the same as the water on Earth. So we've had to revise our theories about where the Earth's water come from. But then there's still this big debate between some people who believe that the water was there on Earth when the Earth formed, or either it's buried in the Earth when the Earth formed, then it was basically exhaled through uh, percolation and volcanic eruptions in the early Earth. And there's still some people who believe that, no, it's delivered from outside Earth on comets and from different source regions. And it's still, we, so we're still debating. We don't know where that came from. But absolutely, the Earth has been hit many times over, over its history by comets, but not so much now as it was in the past. Okay, that's great. Thanks. Paul, I'll hand over to you. Philip Mulcahy, have yeah, the next uh, question. Thank you. As a comet loses dust with each pass of the sun, does the resuming mass loss have the effect of continuing reducing the, its orbit size? Um, well, no. Um, so, so the question, yeah, the question is, is that as the comet loses all its material as it goes around the sun, does the orbit continuously shrink? And absolutely not. The comet orbit, comet orbits do change, but they change. One type of change is because of the of the material um, coming out. But it's like a jet reaction. So uh, here we go. So here's a here's a toy comet, and here's the sunlight coming in. Okay, and all the gas and dust fly off one way and newton's third law of motion tells us for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction so if all the material flies off this way the comet is pushed back the other direction a little bit so by comets going around the sun they actually change their own orbits now it doesn't always shrink them it can actually grow them so comet orbits uh, can always slightly change. An even bigger effect, though, will be if it passes close to a planet. And Jupiter is a, has got a tremendous effect on comet orbits. It can throw comets all over the place. In fact, when we look at the very longest period orbits, orbits uh, of comets, comets coming in from what we call the Oort cloud, which, get, which extends about at least half a parsec. Um, out or a third of a parsec out from our sun. When those comets come in, only about half of them will ever uh, and go around the sun for the first time. Only about half of them will ever come back. 
Half of them are lost to interstellar space to they're completely ejected from the solar system due to the effect either of Jupiter or this reaction effect of material coming out on the sunward side. So comet orbits do change, but it's not uh, a, just a one way process. And in, in, indeed, uh, uh, when we look at comets with short periods, such as Beretti, or even Halley's Comet, which is coming around every 76 years, by far the dominant effect on those comet orbits is by gravitational pulls and tugs by the other planets in our solar system, the, by the giant planets in our solar system. Thanks. Uh, Colm asks, what upcoming projects designed to teach us more about comets, be the, be the new space telescope or new space probe like Rosetta, are you most excited about? Okay, right, but there's two. I, I, if you talk about space projects, I'll say two. One is what we saw launched on Christmas Day, the James Webb Space Telescope. Because one problem we have on Earth studying comets is that the, 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 the original ices that are most of the ices that are released from a comet surface, the water and carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, are very difficult to study from the surface of the Earth. We only really do it with bright comets. Whereas JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope, can view these gases really clearly in the infrared, what it's built, one of the things it's built to do. So James Webb is going to tell us a lot about how comets behave and how they change over time. Then in terms of a comet directed uh, mission, I must mention Comet Interceptor. Now, this is a new project that was that was approved only a couple of years ago by the European Space Agency. And it's due and it's because most of the comets we have visited, in fact, all the comets we have visited have been around the sun many times, even Giotto when it was at Halley's Comet. We know Halley's Comet has been around the sun many times, but we've never been up close to one of these or, or these original comets and their first approach to the sun from somewhere like the Oort cloud. So Comet Interceptor will launch in 2029 and it will go to the same parking position as the James Webb Space Telescope, the Lagrangian point, uh, about a million kilometers, the other side of the moon's orbit. And it will sit there for up to five years and we will wait for a comet uh, just right with just the right orbit coming in from the Oort cloud. And then, then Comet Interceptor will basically fire its thrusters. It will leave that Lagrangian point and go and intercept and fly through that comet. And so we'll have our first clear up, clear close up view of the nucleus of a new comet coming into the sun for the very first time. Uh, Cause we really have no idea what that's gonna look like. So that's gonna be incredibly exciting. But that means that interception, by the way, let's plan ahead. That's going to that could take place sometime in the year 2035 or 2036, depending on which comets are discovered between now and then. So we're going to have to hang on for a bit. Look uh, it up, Comet Interceptor. They have a good website. Uh, John Roach asks, how do comets rebuild from the dust and material they lose coming close to the sun? OK, well, uh, how do comets rebuild from the dust and gas they lose when they come near the sun? They don't. Some of it will naturally fall back onto the surface. And we saw that happening at Comet 67P with Rosetta. But the majority of it just goes out and never comes back. Every time a comet goes around the sun, it shrinks a bit. It loses some material that will never come back. It, and generally, with a comet such as 67P or Halley's Comet, it loses about a metre thickness of its surface on average every time it goes around the sun. So put it this way, wait 100,000 years and Halley's Comet won't be around anymore. It'll be gone. It'll all be used up. So aren't we lucky? We're here now. Uh, you kind of covered this already, but I'll ask the question, John Walsh, is, is the water from the comets the same as we have on Earth or is it heavy water? Okay, actually, um, yes and no. Uh, we have this direct measurement, very precise measurement of the type of water that we, ha uh, uh, we have in 67P from the Rosetta spacecraft. And I should explain what happens is that in water we have H2O. So we have two hydrogen atoms and an oxygen atom. Now, that hydrogen might be 
It might be normal hydrogen, or it might have a heavier nucleus, what we call deut deuterium. And the ratio of that he slightly heavier water molecule to normal water is very constant around the Earth. It's kind of a, a fingerprint of water on Earth. And so if comets delivered Earth's water to us, then comets should have that same fingerprint. It should have the same ratio of slightly heavier water molecules to the normal water molecules. And what Rosetta showed very clearly was that 67P doesn't. But it's more confused because other comets have been measured from Earth, the brighter comets, uh, where we've got the signal. And for those comets, they have measured the same water uh, value. So we're not sure at the moment, we're a little confused because clearly there seems to be a spread of, of the ratios of these different types of water in comets. We've only measured five or six of them. We need to make a lot more measurements, but we certainly don't have a clear picture yet of whether or not um, uh, some of the water on Earth came from comets or uh, very little of it. We don't think now anymore that all of it came from comets. And in fact, it could be that going back to, I think, Peter's original question, it could be that rather than going from comets, a lot of Earth's water could have come from the outer asteroid belt, where we know there is subsurface water underneath the rocks. And it could, and our measurements of water in meteorites from the outer, that have come to us from the outer asteroid belt, does match the makeup of Earth's water. So it could be we were looking a little bit too far out in the solar system. We needed to look a little bit closer to home to actually identify the source of all, all our water and, of course, what makes life possible here on Earth. Ted Hoyback asks, are pristine comets red like Argos, Pluto and change back, change to black later due to outgassing? Um, so uh, actually, to be honest, uh, all comets tend to be dark and red. When we look at their surfaces, we, we, we're finding that more and more that the vast majority of them share a very similar, these, these similar things that they're red because they reflect more red light than blue light. So that if, you, if they were eyes were sensitive enough, you'd see them as red or at least pinkish. But again, they're very dark because they're covered in this dark carbon rich and chemically organic rich material with this comet dust, which really lowers them to about the, the reflectivity of a lump of coal. So um, they, they wouldn't look, they would look just black by eye, I think, but we certainly don't think they actually change to black later due to that gas. And we think that's just generally there continuously. Although we don't know yet, because maybe if we go with Comet Interceptor to a brand new comet coming in, we will see something different. It's just that all the comets we've studied to date have been old comets. And the final question, does the slingshot effect on a comet by the sun reducing strength on each pass resulting in reducing the orbit size? I think you kind of covered that. Yeah, well, no, just, just to be clear there, just to explain this. No, there, there is no kind of slingshot effect on a comet with the sun. A comet's just going around the sun. And if, if there's nothing else in the solar system, it would keep the same orbit. But because... Well, first of all, because of the outgassing, that can change the, the orbit a little bit. But also, when it's out in the out, if it goes past the Earth or maybe Venus, and certainly if it goes anywhere near Jupiter or Saturn, that's going to have the bigger effect on its orbit. So these orbits change all the time. Sometimes they get smaller, sometimes they get bigger. And to actually figure out what's going to happen, we're, we're pretty good now at calculating what the, what the future orbit of a comet will be as long as it doesn't do anything itself with this jet reaction. And if it does, then all bets are off. We, we just have to watch it and see what it does. Uh, Alan, uh, I, as you well know, uh, comets are endlessly fascinating to amateur astronomers, and uh, we're delighted to find out they're endlessly fascinating to, uh, to, to, to you as well. And you've certainly managed to break down for us uh, some of the factors which make for a great comet. Uh, I picked up a slight hint in one of your answers when we were talking about asteroids, 
that you might be willing to talk to us again at some future time. And I think we'd be delighted uh, to issue you with another invitation. I know Belfast is a long way from Cork, but if actually you found yourself down in Cork someday, we'd be more than delighted to actually meet you in person. And I, I, I hope that one day that will happen. Thanks ever so much for coming to talk to us. I'd, I'd certainly like to visit you all in the flesh in Cork myself. It's a lovely part of the world. So uh, <laughs> thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for all the kind comments. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.